Welcome to the Grace Hour, the live international talk radio ministry of Greater Grace Church in Baltimore, Maryland. You can join us on the air today by calling 1-800-338-7060 or 410-483-3700 from outside of the United States. Now, here is our host. And welcome, friends, to this edition of the Grace Hour, broadcasting live right here from our studios, which are located at the home of the Greater Grace World Outreach in Baltimore, Maryland. Great to be with you, friends, on this Tuesday afternoon. And we trust that each and every one of you had a blessed Christmas as we celebrated the birth of our Savior. And we, uh, we're thrilled to have you back as we start this week of broadcasting, which, of course, started on yesterday's broadcast. But um, I'm back in the studio. I'm joined today by Pastor Sturge Gorham, and we'll be your hosts for the next hour. And we look forward to having you join us as well for following the devotional message today. We'll open the phone lines and invite you to join us. And we hope that many of you will accept that invitation, pick up your phone, and join us live on the Tuesday edition of the Grace Hour. Here are the telephone numbers. If you'd like, you can jot them down although we will give you these numbers throughout the broadcast. The toll-free number in North America, 800-338-7060. And again, please feel free to dial that number if you're in the States or north of us in Canada. Look forward to hearing from anyone and everyone up there north of us. I want to welcome those of you tuning in and listening live to the Grace Hour locally on our station here in Baltimore, WRBS. You can find WRBS 1230 on your AM dial, and we'd like to welcome all of you folks that are listening locally here to our broadcast. It's great to have you with us, and we're excited about this theme this week, what it means to be quickened to life, and quickened, of course, by God's Spirit, quickened by the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And again, we read that as Paul wrote that letter to the Romans and spoke about that great principle of what it means to be quickened, made alive, and brought to new life through the power of the Holy Spirit and the new birth. Uh, great to have you with us, friends. We want to remind uh, those of you that are listening live on the Internet that, of course, you can join us uh, when those phone lines are open. We hope to hear from some of you. Welcome to our international audience on this Tuesday afternoon. And everyone that's both listening and watching, uh, on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. Uh, good morning to some of you that are, well, wherever you're listening, it's morning, and good afternoon to others, and good evening <laughs> to the rest of you that are tuning in to the Grace Hour. And as I mentioned, Pastor Sturge Gorham is with us, and we will continue our conversation live here in the studio. And again, following our devotional, uh, we want to welcome you and your phone calls. So as we begin the broadcast today in Romans, the 13th chapter, and the 11th verse, we're going to read verses 11 through 14. And Paul writes and says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, nor in chambering and wantonness, not in strife or envying, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not make a provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. You know, in these verses, it's almost as if the Apostle Paul, his message <laughs> might be, well, we could put it this way. You need to learn how to live like you are dying. Because in reality, <laughs> we are, as far as this temporal existence is concerned. But we should, as born-again believers that have been saved, born again, and again indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we should live like we were dying. In other words, we should be doing our living on purpose. Instead of, you know, moving through life without a sense of urgency, we should have that sense of urgency based upon something than merely the pursuit of pleasure, which seems to characterize so many people's lives in our culture today, 
just looking for pleasure, just looking for a new experience, just looking for the next thing that's going to take place in their schedule of life. But we need to look at life from this perspective. It's almost as if there's a fire alarm going off in our world today. And it's, it's possible that many people are sleeping through it, <laughs> almost snoring their way through it, even God's people. And to be honest with you, that's not the first time that something like that has happened. You know, if you've ever stayed uh, in a hotel room and the fire alarm goes off, I mean, that's, that's a warning. That means as comfortable as you may be, you need to get up and you need to get out of that building. Um, whether or not it's a false alarm or there's actually a fire, that really doesn't matter. Uh, when the alarm goes off, you got to take it seriously. But again, is this the first time in the history of the human race or in the history of our country or your country, wherever you may be listening to the Grace Hour today? Is that the first time that that happened? The answer is no. Let me read to you some quotes from different men of God. One brother named Charles Brown, and we're not talking about Charlie Brown, the cartoon character. This was a Midwestern evangelist, and I quote him. He says, It has been a year of very limited spiritual fruit and great destitution. It's as though the church has fallen asleep, end quote. Charles Spurgeon once said, I am sure I need not unroll a page of history and ask you to glance your eye down it, except even for a second, for again and again, you will see that it has occurred that the church has fallen asleep and her ministers have become destitute of zeal, having no ardent passion, end quote. Henry Richard, Quote, <clears throat> pardon me, it is not correct to say that the church fell asleep in the last century <laughs> simply because it has never been awake, end quote. And Vance Havner said the, the devil has chloroformed the atmosphere of this age. We need to take down our do not disturb signs, snap out of our stupor, come out of our coma, and awake from our apathy. Again, these, these are pretty serious words spoken by these men of God. A.W. Tozer once said this, God's alarm has been going off for years. The question is, are we listening? Let's wake up, you and I. And when you hear these quotes from these different men of God, you can almost hear the voice of Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane at night, imploring his disciples when he said, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Behold, the hour is at hand. From Matthew chapter 26, verses 40 and 45. Well, in Romans, the 13th chapter, these words that we read just a moment ago from the Apostle Paul, they offer some keys, some important instructions, whereby you and I can resist the seductiveness of this world. And make no mistake about it, this world is very seductive. And I don't mean that in a sensual sense. I mean in the sense that it, it has the power to draw us away from God. It has the power to draw us away from the assembling of God's people. It has the power to draw us away from what really matters, what's really important, eternal realities, eternity itself. So when Paul made these statements, again in Romans chapter 13, he said in verse 11, knowing the time, that it is high time. It's fascinating because he uses that word time a couple of times in that sentence. And when he uses the term high time, the Greek word is kairos, referring to the kind of quality of time or a season or an opportunity. Again, we're not talking about the other Greek word, chronos, which is, it, it, that speaks of the successive moments of time, time marching on. Time clearly is the theme of his passage. And as we get ready to turn the calendar of yet another year, time should be the theme of our lives. In the Old Testament, believe it or not, friends, there were actually a group of men who were appointed for the specific purpose of discerning the times. Yes, 
First Chronicles 12, 32. This is what we read. The sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. That's incredible, friends. Again, a group of men appointed specifically to understanding the times in which they lived, to discern those times. God wants us to do the same thing. This is a critical hour of human history that we find ourselves living in, and we need to discern the times. You know, on one occasion in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus actually scolded his critics, and he said this to them. He said, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. You know, it's like a meteorologist. What does he do? But he, he monitors, you know, uh, barometric pressures. We should be monitoring the spiritual barometric readings of the times that we find ourselves living in today. Now, some people, when they hear this, well, they would actually scoff, or laugh at this whole idea. But we shouldn't be surprised. The Apostle Peter spoke of such people. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, when he said these words, he said, scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Yes, the scoffers will come. The scoffers are here today. And friends, these scoffers are not unbelievers outside of the church. These are scoffers in the midst of the church. The skeptics seem to be smiling and saying, you know, that, that hysteria about the coming of Christ, that's been with us every decade since the Bible was opened. And, you know, it always you hear people talking about that the end times are upon us, the imminence of of Christ's return. We don't need to be worried about that. We need to get about the business of living our lives. Well, friends, the imminent return of Christ is a reality. And when the scriptures speak of the imminent return of Christ, it means at any moment. We've got to ask ourselves a question. Are we living that way? Are we living in such a way that Christ could come back and return at any moment. And again, we're not talking about date setting here. We're not that foolish. The scriptures warn us repeatedly not to enter into such folly. We're not talking about setting dates or times or saying this is when Jesus will return. Foolish people have said that in the past and they've watched those dates come and go. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the reality of Christ's coming. And that's why our hearts and minds need to be quickened to the truth of that reality. Uh, a, a brother named Dr. Paul Kintner from Cornell University, he said this. He said, it, it's terribly difficult to inspire people to prepare for a potential crisis that has never happened before and may not happen for decades to come. Now think about what he's saying. If something had never, has never happened before, how do you really prepare people's hearts and minds? for that reality? How do you prepare someone for a potential crisis that's never happened or might not happen for decades to come? Just because a highly probable event has not yet occurred is no guarantee that it will never happen. The rapture of the church is going to happen. Mark it down. Don't be like that pastor who once said, and he, he's not in our ministry, thank God, but he said that, he said to his church, because there was so much talk about the rapture, so much communication about the second coming of Christ that he finally felt led to get into the pulpit. He said, listen, the rapture is irrelevant. Friends, you know and I know that five seconds after the rapture happens, he'll realize how relevant it was. Again, Paul said these words, it's high time for us to awake, to be quickened out of our sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. 
And when Paul uses that word for salvation, it's a dynamic word, and it comes to us in three different tenses, three dramatic dimensions, if you will. Past salvation, when you and I said yes to Jesus, we were saved, we were born again, we were sealed by the Holy Spirit, our sins washed by the blood of Jesus, our debt to God was declared paid in full, and then we were seated with him in heavenly places in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. That's what our past salvation. Then we have our present salvation. It's an ongoing growth process. We are being conformed into the very image of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit through prayer and through the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. And then there is the future salvation. What's Paul, that's what Paul is talking about here the day when we're finally free from the presence of sin. That's what Paul tells us is nearer than when we first believed. It's as though God is telling us to stand by. Something wonderful is in the wings. And you could almost say it this way. On your automobile, on your mirrors that are placed on both sides of your cars, you'll notice that there's a little image that's printed on those mirrors that says, warning, objects, you know, uh, in the rearview mirror are closer than they may appear. Well, it's almost as if the Apostle Paul is saying, objects in the biblical mirror are closer than they may appear. Friends, this is the reality that we have to look forward to. And again, when we say it's imminent, we mean at any time moment. We've talked about the imminent return of Christ. And think about the incentive of the Lord's return. So, well, what is the incentive regarding the Lord's return? Well, there's, there's still work to be done. Now, don't misunderstand me when I use that word. There's no work that needs to be done to secure our eternal salvation. That work was finished on Calvary's cross. But the work that needs to be done, again, it's not for our salvation, but it's a result of our salvation. And what is that work? To proclaim the gospel, to preach Christ to those who don't know him. You know, let's allow the catastrophic events of our present day to serve as, well, it should make an impact on us, on our souls, and then make an impact on us. Uh, on, uh, on our collective sense of urgency. And that's really what its purpose is. I mean, let's take a look around us and see what's happening in our world and let what's happening create a spiritual sense of urgency within our hearts. Again, to quote Charles Spurgeon, who once said this to his own nation, the people of England, he said, you can sleep, but you cannot induce the devil to close his eyes. The prince of the power of the air keeps his servants well up into their work. And if we could, with a glance, see the activities of the servants of Satan, we would be astonished at our own sluggishness. That is to say that the devil is working overtime to continue to blind the hearts and minds of unbelievers. Paul's intention here in Romans chapter 13 was to astonish his readers, to wake them up. That's so important. You know, he even started that passage in verse 10 and started it by saying, don't owe any man anything but to love them. Why? Because that is the fulfillment of all that the law had ever required. It's almost as if Paul is saying, love takes care of the bill whatever that bill may be. Love is the incentive for making right choices under great stress and great duress. One writer says, with every passing day, we pitch our moving tent a day's march closer to home. It's true, friends. How much time do we have? How much time do you have? None of us knows for certain But I like to be quickened to the fact that uh, my days are indeed numbered. And knowing that, the Spirit of God reminds us that we should number 
our days in Psalm 90, verse 12, and give ourselves over to understanding and live lives with wisdom. We haven't been promised long life here on the earth. None of us have. If we should live a long life, that's to the, you know, to the credit of God's grace, and we're thankful for it. But why are we here? That's a question that we need to ask ourselves. And are we taking full advantage of our opportunities in these challenging and difficult days that we find ourselves living in? Again, it's important that we not only remind ourselves of how limited our time here is on the earth, not only should we remind ourselves that our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed, but then we should remind ourselves that with each passing day, there's another opportunity that God has given us to declare his name and to declare his righteousness as a gift to anyone who would believe on him. Well, friends, we'll stop right there today, and we'll continue these thoughts tomorrow on the Wednesday edition of the Grace Hour, and we look forward to sharing a little bit more of these principles from Romans chapter 13 with you. But now we'll, again, take a break and ask you to go to your phones and fill up those lines at the following numbers, 800-338-7060. That's toll-free in North America, and locally, 410-483-3700. And we hope to hear from many of you today. Again, God wants us to be quickened in our hearts, in our minds, quickened to the opportunities that he presents before us, quickened moment by moment by the power of his Holy Spirit who lives within each one of us. And again, if necessary, to hear that alarm, to hear that alarm. This is no time to go to sleep spiritually. This is a time to be quickened, to be awakened by the Spirit of God, to see and to recognize the hour in which we're living. And again, in 1 John chapter 3, the Apostle John wrote to believers everywhere, and he didn't say these are the last days. He said this is the last hour. That's a great way to look at life today, friends. We're living in the last hour, and let's redeem that time. Father, bless these thoughts. Bless the remainder of our broadcast today. We ask you to do that in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You're listening live to the Grace Hour, friends. Phone lines are now open. Looking forward to hearing from you. Here are those numbers, 800-338-7060. And locally here in Baltimore, 410-483-3700. Again, Pastor Sturge Gorham has joined us in the studio today. Pastor Sturge, your thoughts. Well, I just uh, it's a little a little bit hilarious, but I remember being in Chile with you, Pastor Love, back in the uh, mid '80s, and uh, we were sitting in someone's living room, and uh, I think I I had a a lot of jet lag, but I was sitting there and I was sleeping. <laughs> Everybody left the ha- ran out of the house. There was an earthquake, and I was I slept through the entire earthquake. Oh. <laughs> everybody, oh boy! Everybody said, "Don't you know what just happened?" I said, "No." What? They said we had a we had an earthquake, and I I I chuckled because I was thinking that's how many of us live. I mean, we could we could, there could be a revival going on, and people are sleeping mm. spiritually sleeping in the middle of it, and um. While you were speaking, Pastor Love, that was amazing what you said because that that spiritual sleep that happens, all of us, every one of us, it is so easy for us when God is present to be asleep. And I and I thought of Brother Lawrence in his book Practicing the Prayer. I said, Lord, how I'm listening to this, but how do I keep from falling asleep? And I and I thought of what he said. It's just it's just the realization that the Lord is here all the time, that he is, he is near, he is here, and just uh, on a daily basis, on a moment-by-moment basis, saying, Lord Jesus, you are here. And in 1 John 3, 1 John 2, at the end of the chapter, 
I love what John said. Uh, Little children, abide in him. Abide in him so that when he appears, uh, you may have confidence and not be ashamed or not withdraw or shrink back at his appearing. And that, to me, is the key of, of being ready to meet Christ, is that we just simply abide in his presence moment by moment in the reality of it. I love that. I love that. Uh, First John 2.28, it's always, it's always quickened me personally because those two options exist for every believer. He is coming. And, and John doesn't question that. He just reminds us that he is coming. And what the challenge is in that verse is, do you want to be ashamed or do you want to be confident? I mean, I can only speak for myself. I want to be confident at his appearing. And I'm afraid that it's quite possible because of the nature of spiritual sluggishness and the fact that, I mean, the illustration of you sleeping through the earthquake is a good one. Yeah. It's like a lot of people can sleep through, you know, the fire alarms. Uh, yeah. When the wake-up call comes, the alarm clock in the morning, people can sleep right through it. Well, these sounds, you can hear them today. And it's, these are all given to us by God to say, listen, wake up. Don't let these hours pass you by without realizing that you're living with great opportunity. Take that opportunity. Again, mm-hmm. I, I love that with what Spurgeon said. We're not talking about work for salvation. That work is done. We're talking about the work that takes place after salvation, right? Uh, we're saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, reaching the world for Christ, going to parts of the world that have never heard the gospel, removing the veil of darkness so that people can see the glorious light of Christ. Well, we've reached the end of another broadcast, or at least locally here, friends, on our local station. We do have another half hour coming your way, and we are very much excited about the possibility of you picking up that phone and dialing one of those numbers. Looking forward to having you join us at 800-338-7060 and locally 410-483-3700. Stay with us if you can, friends. If not, we'll join you tomorrow at the same time. We're back with you live, friends, at gracehour.org and Facebook Live, YouTube Live, and looking forward to having you join us by phone. If you have access to a phone right now and you can join us, well, share your thoughts with us. What does it mean for you personally to be quickened, quickened to life, not just being alive biologically speaking? Um, Again, if you are listening to us, you're alive biologically speaking. But what does it mean to be spiritually quickened? You know, Pastor Sturge, there's that beautiful verse in Psalm 119, verse 25, which says, my soul cleaves to the dust. There is within every human soul, even the believer, the propensity, this downward propensity to cleave to the dust. But what does he say? Quicken me according to thy word. Nothing has the power to quicken our hearts and minds like the word of God. And when the word of God is preached and proclaimed, it has that quickening sense to our souls. It addresses that part of us that otherwise could slip into spiritual slumber and stay there forever. Yeah. And, 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 and I, I was thinking the same verse uh, as you were sharing, I was thinking that we can, we must put ourselves in a place where the word can quicken us. It doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen by osmosis. We, we need to bring ourselves to a place where we're quickened by the word, whether it's to church or whether it's a fellowship. I, I woke up yesterday morning feeling like my soul was cleaving to the dust, and I, I called a friend up. I said, let's, let's have breakfast together, because I just needed the fellowship, and, and we just fellowshiped around the message the night before, and I was so quickened. But it, it's like we have so many opportunities to be quickened. We, let's, let's take advantage of them. Yeah, I, I love the way one businessman gathered all of his associates together one day, And he said, gentlemen, we are surrounded by insurmountable opportunities. (laughs) (laughs) And that's true. 
Yes. But sometimes they come in different forms which make them unrecognizable. But yet it could be suffering, it could be sickness, it could be financial needs, it could be a broken relationship, it could be a broken heart. Many of those things and so much more could be opportunities in disguise. Because have not we experienced great spiritual growth through some of the biggest hardships that we've experienced in life? Yeah, and that's what Ezra, I mean, you just quoted Ezra in Psalm 119. I mean, time after time, I was reading the verses right before the program. My soul cleaves to the dust, quicken me according to thy word. I am severely afflicted. Quicken me according to thy loving kindness. There's another There's another uh, one of God's gifts that quicken us. How about that? How about you drag yourself into a church service? Your soul is dragging in the dirt, and then someone comes up to you and just says, hey, I love you. You are, you are so precious to me, and you're quickened. And, and there's so many ways that the Lord, uh, he raises us up from, that, from the dust and uh, sets us on our feet. He does that, and he does it so faithfully. Um, Lise, thank you for your comment on Facebook Live. She says, it's the grace hour that quickens me at midday. Uh, amen. And I trust and we trust that uh, you're not alone, that many of those of you that are listening either on Facebook Live, YouTube Live, or live on the Internet are quickened as well. Um, we got uh, someone from uh, YouTube has reached out to us. The question is, what advice do you have for people that are having difficulty finding fellowship? That's a great question. That is a great question. I I would start with a with a, a program like this. Obviously, you're you're listening in on this program. Amen. And um, we might be able to direct you to some somebody in your area, a church in your area, if you if you're not finding fellowship. But I think that's a really important question. And I just I would say to you, just pray, pray for a godly friend because uh, that that can make all the difference in the world. Absolutely. And again, if you don't have that local assembly, you know that God in his faithfulness will lead you to that right local assembly. But if you've got a friend and you know that that friend is committed to seeing you succeed spiritually, you call them, reach out to them. I mean, you said you did it yesterday, yep. right? Um, because that's the best way to, to deal with the spiritual sluggishness that we can experience in our souls from time to time. Yeah. Uh, because... You know, unlike what some people's impressions or opinions are of us, like, you know, we're always walking on top of the, of the world and we're always, you know, we always have a, a spring in our step and a song in our heart. That isn't always the case, is it? No. I mean, reality is we face the same challenges that other people face, but we do so from a different perspective. We are looking to God to quicken us, to make us alive to stimulate our spiritual senses so that we begin to see life through the lens of Scripture and we see one another through the finished work of Christ. Yeah. And I think, I was thinking too, that sometimes we need to be the ones to initiate the conversation. I, I just think so many, you, you can only talk so much about sports. You can only talk so much about COVID. You can only talk so much about what's going on in this world. Why not in your conversation initiate a verse, a promise, something that God's spoken to you. Don't wait. Don't, don't necessarily wait for someone else to quicken you. You take the initiative. And yeah. it's amazing how that just, it just, it's like kindling the fire. Yeah. Kindling the fire. Yeah. Stoke it. Stoke it. Stoke that fire. Right? Yeah. And, and it does make me also think of the relationship between David and Jonathan and how everyone longs for a relationship with someone like they had. You know, and so you hear this so often. People, they say, oh, if I, I, what I need is I need, you know, a Jonathan in my life. Well, here's the point. Be a Jonathan to someone else, right? Yes. Someone said when you're feeling a little bit down and, and you're discouraged, he said, then he goes, I'm going to give you 10 things to do. Reach out to someone that has a need. And, and that's, he said, that's the first one. The other nine? Just repeat that first one nine more times. <laughs> That's great. Just keep reaching out to That's someone. That's great. And, and guess what will happen? 
your needs will be replaced by the needs of others. Yep. That's how to live yep. life. Isaiah 58, I was just really quick. I know we have some callers, but I remember one Thanksgiving morning, I was, uh, my, both of my kids had moved away, and it was our first Thanksgiving alone, and woke up, and I felt a little just, just depressed, it, you know, like, what, you know, what do we do? And, and uh, God led me to Isaiah 58 about the fast. Is this not this the fast I've chosen to deal out your bread to the hungry, to, to satisfy the long soul? Then shall your light shine in obscurity. Wow. Then shall your darkness break forth as the noonday. And I remember, and, and immediately after that, the Lord said, go, go with Pastor Dan on Thanksgiving outreach. And I had the best Thanksgiving I've ever had. Praise God. Yep. That's awesome. Let's go to the phones. Uh, beginning with Duke Horton, Pastor Duke up in York, Pennsylvania, or at least in that general vicinity. Pastor Duke, welcome. Hi, Pastor Love. Hi, Pastor Sturge. Merry Christmas and uh, early Happy New Year to both of you and all those at Grace Hour. Thank you, brother. Me too. Uh, we are we are definitely quickened by this program, absolutely, com- uh, constantly, and man, we're so thankful and grateful. Pastor Love, your message today was just so, uh, man, what can I say? It's just a wow, another one of those wow messages. You're talking about um, time, and you read those quotes from those men of God in the past that even in their generations they were dealing with, you know, the aspect of a sleeping church. And I kept thinking about Christ in Luke 19, I've been studying uh, again for, I don't know, a while off and on the 70-week prophecy of Daniel, and I'm amazed at how Jesus in Luke 19, the triumphal entry when he said in verses 42 through 44, he said, if you would have known your this day, number one, then he said in verse 44, if you'd known the time mm-hmm. of your visitation. And it's amazing, right, the religious leaders, the Pharisees and all the religious community, they were clueless that this was the day that Daniel prophesied in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, about the triumphal entry. And there's an amazing book by a man named Honer. He he actually did a book, it's called The Chronological Times of the Life of Christ. And it's such a phenomenal book, and he did such uh, detailed work on it, where literally the day was prophesied in Daniel 9, and Jesus was referring to that. And it's only the common people, you know, they got out their palm branches and they were saying, Hosanna, they knew it, just like the wise men knew the prophecy that referred to Christ's birth in Bethlehem. They traveled from from Persia to come and see Christ, and they weren't religious Jews, right? They were just pagans in Babylon, and they knew the prophecy, and they came. So it's amazing, like what your message is saying. There's there's a time in our lives where the Holy Spirit awakens us to the time that we're in, and then there's a whole community of other people that are just living in darkness, and that's why God has us here right? Like Paul said in Acts 26, that we, God's call was to bring light to those who are living in the darkness. So, Mm. man, what an awesome message, Pastor Love, to just get us warmed up for the new year. Amen? Yeah. And and, and isn't it a great way to move into 2022 is to remind ourselves that we are here in Christ's stead and bringing with us a ministry of reconciliation to the lost. And another way of saying it is we are his ambassadors. So let's remind ourselves that that's our high and holy calling and let's function in that and let's not be ashamed of it. And amen, that's beautiful. One other thought I had was that you know, there's a we hear of a lot of like prophecy conferences and all these people that you know they go from one prophecy conference to another, and I'm not I'm not necessarily against that, but I think people sometimes in the church right now we know that the rapture is any moment, like you said, but what's Christ doing? He still wants to build his church and he still wants to save the lost. So let's be engaged in what his activity is and what the Holy Spirit is doing. The purpose of the church is, is not 
stopped, right? We're going to we're going to keep evangelizing and discipling those until he calls us up. That's that's what gives us our great uh, purpose, and, and like Pastor Sturge was saying a moment ago, we're quickened in that. If that's our focus, we're quickened. Amen? Amen. Mm. That's that's beautiful. Mm. Yeah, because you could go from prophecy seminar to prophecy seminar throughout the course of your whole life and keep hearing about it, but we know it's a reality. We know it's going to come to pass, so let's redeem the time that we have and let's see people brought into the kingdom of God. Amen. Pastor Duke, thanks for the call, and thanks for the encouraging words. Always great to hear from you. Thank you, Pastor Love. Pastor Sturge, I love you guys so much. Have a blessed New Year. You too, brother. You do the same. Love you. 800-338-7060 is the toll-free number. Locally, it's 410-483-3700. Let's go up to Hudson, Massachusetts, where John is joining us live in the Grace Hour. John, welcome. It's amazing you're talking about being quick in the day, because I, one main problem I have is falling asleep in church. <laughs> I mean, if I, if I drink caffeine, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's just an attack from the enemy, and I, just, and, I, and I have problems with falling asleep in church. I think it's genetic, because my dad had the same problem. Well, uh, we, we sure appreciate your honesty, John. <laughs> how, how do I overcome it? Stand I, up. <laughs> the whole yeah, service. there you go. <laughs> tell, tell Pastor... Bailey, that you're going to be walking back and forth in the back of the church during the message, <laughs> interceding and listening at the same time. <laughs> With my luck, I'll fall asleep when I'm walking. <laughs> <laughs> no sleepwalking allowed. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Boy, you guys are doing such a great job. I, I love listening to Grace Hour every day, and, and what a blessing it is to have this teaching, knowing that it's true. Yeah. It, wow. it's, it's, I got it is quick from, from from ministry the other day, and the the guy's a post-tribulationist, and I couldn't believe it. Yeah, he's saying that, that the rapture is not going to happen. It's not going to happen until after the tribulation. But it says that we've not been appointed under wrath, so we we have to go before the tribulation period. Yeah, and and it it makes a lot of stands up to reason, John, that if the church were to go through the tribulation, which as we know is a judgment, is yeah. the church in need of such a judgment? The only way you no. could justify that is to suggest that whatever Christ did on the cross was not sufficient payment for sin. Amen. And we know it was because he said it's finished. So there's That's no right. f- there's no further need for believers to be purged or punished or whatever they want to call it because yeah. again, it is a judgment. It is the wrath of God poured out upon an unbelieving, Christ-rejecting world during the tribulation, and to place a part of the church, a single member of the church in that tribulation, makes absolute no sense whatsoever. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, that we're, we're going to be going, we might be taken up before we hang up from this phone call. That's right. Yes. And if not, it'll happen after. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, John. Well, we, We will see you here, there, or in the air. There you go. God bless you, my friend. Thank you. Thanks for the call. 410-483-3700. Plenty of time for you to give us a call. And David is joining us from up in the great state of Maine. Someone said this morning at our staff meeting, Dave, that a friend of theirs was out of the country. They were in Maine. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Sure feels that way. Yeah. <laughs> I'll bet it does from time to time. It does. Well, at least I got you guys I can pray for during the week and call up and talk to and get counsel from. And uh, just before Christmas, uh, God gave me a, a verse from uh, Malachi chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, it says, Have we not all one Father? Hath not God created us? One God created us. Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? And uh, I think I got quicker than most once. Uh, I was in this uh, Bible study the first time an old friend invited me, and and uh, people were speaking in uh, languages I didn't understand and doing very spiritual things, and then they started criticizing my pastor. And uh, 
I'd never felt the blood pump up through my face before. <laughs> and uh, I guess you'd call it a holy rage. I don't know. But I did quote, you know, who art thou that judgest another man's servant to his own master he standeth or falleth? And, uh, and then I left. And uh, I guess that's being quickened. I don't know. But, oh, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I like the way you gave an answer to that criticism. You let the scripture do the talking for you. Yeah, yeah, because I really don't have much capacity to memorize scripture, but if you read it enough, you know it's in there. And uh, and yeah, uh, I was listening to C.S. Lewis. I listened to him often this morning. I just got through uh, mere Christianity again. I thought I knew it, but you never really know it. You have to keep listening over and over again. And uh, he was talking about the sensual sins and all the attention they get, but how that uh, the gossip and the backbiting and the, and the, the judging and uh, the spiritual pride and uh, how those are much more difficult to deal with and shake off. So, but uh, and my daughter wanted me to have prayer for her. Her fiance is uh, in the hospital with. Uh, well, private conditions, I guess you'd say, but pray for her and him, and they're thinking about getting married, and uh, it's kind of going back and forth, and uh, I I pray God has the best that he'll work out for him, and, and I guess I had not to take any more of your time, so. Well, you're a blessing, Dave. You, you never take enough time. We, I'm trying to remember what you look like. I know I know you, but... Uh... But uh, one day we'll we'll meet we'll meet up together. But Lord, we just pray for this precious brother. Um, he is so dear to us, Lord. We thank you so much for him and his for his family. We pray for these situations, and you know what the need is, Lord Jesus, better than we do. And and uh, we thank you, Holy Spirit, that when we don't even know how to pray, that you intercede for us. And we just pray for your will to be done. And uh, Thank you so much for this precious brother. Bless him and give him an awesome new year. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, you do a great job, and you're so faithful, and, uh, and God bless you both, yes. Thank you, David. Too, Dave. Right. Always a Bye -bye. pleasure to hear from yep. you. Yep. Phone lines are open at 800-338-7060. Give us a call. We've got plenty of time to take your call, friends. 410-483-3760. Zero, zero. And Pastor Sturge, again, think about that statement. With each passing day, we pitch our moving tent a day's march nearer home. Um, because really, that's what our lives, in essence, are. We are moving tents. I mean, the Apostle Paul, when he was approaching the end of his life, he said, he said those words in 2 Timothy chapter 4, that, you know, it was time to pack up his tent, time to break it down and to move on to his heavenly home. That is such a reality for our lives. And every believer should be thinking that way because yeah. this is a temporal existence here on the earth. This is not the real life that God has promised. And unlike what some have suggested, you know, that you can have your best life now, no, friends, our best life is yet to come. Because when you walk with Christ by faith, the best is always yet to come. Yeah. I, right? I, I just thinking about the tent. I, I've talked to so many people just this past year that have gone home to be with the Lord. And there's something to say, to be said about old age. You, you realize that your tent is wearing out. Yeah. And it's, it's a good thing. It's a good reminder for us that we're just we're we're moving on to a, a a mansion to a new home in heaven and uh that's a good thing i i was thinking about first corinthians 7 uh when you were speaking just real briefly but uh, how he said in uh paul said in verse 29 but i say this i say brethren the time is short so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none, those who weep as though they did not weep, those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, 
and those who buy as though they did not possess. And then it just goes on. But I, I thought, you know, we, we don't stop living our lives, but we do it with a mentality that, you know, really Christ is my priority. Christ, Jesus Christ is my priority. And if he's my priority, then these things will, will, will fall into place. Isn't that the greatest challenge for us as believers here on the earth to maintain that godly scale of priorities. And I don't think that that's even possible unless we're being perpetually quickened by God's words, by his spirit. Uh, Otherwise, those priorities, which should be priorities, um, well, they get replaced by things that are urgent Mm -hmm. instead of the necessary priorities, the godly scale of priorities, which we should have, oftentimes they get replaced. And we just need to guard our hearts against that happening. Let's go back to the phones. Uh, Rennie is joining us, I believe, uh, here from the Baltimore area. Rennie, welcome. Hey, Pastor Love, uh, Pastor Sturge. I'm actually in South Dakota. I thought so. I thought so. I thought when you started speaking, I thought I picked up a little accent. (laughs) <laughs> are you are you in Sturgis, South Dakota? <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm in Sioux Falls. Okay, Sturgis is away from uh, away from here. Uh, you're closer, uh, Pastor Love. You're closer to Sturgis than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Today, that is true. <laughs> hey, I wanted to share a testimony about a conversation I had with my granddaughter last night. Um, I was out grilling some uh, chicken and. Uh, in sub freezing temperatures out here, but uh, she uh, she looked at me and she said, "Grumpy, you must be ready to die because you've seen the world." And I just looked at her and I said, "Well, I am ready to die, but that's not why I'm ready to die." I said, "I'm ready to die because I have Jesus as my savior." I said I could see all of the all of the great cities of the world and been on top of all the great mountaintops and in in all the deep valleys and and in the lowest trenches in the ocean and not be ready to die if I didn't have Jesus as oh, my savior. Well said. And, wow. that, uh, that's beautiful. Yeah, you know, at that point she got called away, but I, you know, it's mm. just really an amazing time to uh open up and, and uh, just share with her and, uh, and say, this is what, uh, this is what life is about. Oh, that's, this that's is what, uh, now, yeah. R- Rennie, we got to ask you, does she really call you grumpy? Yes, she does. <laughs> well, we got to change that. What does she think you are? One of, one of the seven dwarfs or something? <laughs> uh, no, it's either grumpy or, uh, or Santa. <laughs> tell her to tell her to go with Santa. I I I, the, the, I don't like the grumpy thing. But but you know words those words spoken to her, um, you never know they could just be embedded in her soul for decades to come. And I think it's so important that whenever we have even the smallest, simplest opportunities just like that to pour into children, grandchildren, great grandchildren. We've got to take those opportunities because, again, they could speak volumes to, to the young hearts that hear them. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rennie. Appreciate it. Thanks, Rennie. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate the call day. there, Grumpy. Keep it up. You're doing a great job. <laughs> well, we only have a few minutes left, Pastor Sturge. Any uh, final thoughts? Oh, wait a minute. We have another caller. Hold on. It's your sister. It's a relative. It's a relative. This is a very relevant call from a relative Jenny Perry is joining us. Hi, Jenny. Hi, boy. I'm under the wire. Um, I I just wanted to say, some years ago, I asked a young man in our church to please, if he were to pray for me, that he would pray this, that the Lord would keep the M word out of my life. And he said, what is that? And I said, mediocrity. Mm -hmm. And as I was listening to you, I was thinking of Pastor Jason Moore's book called in a revolution. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's a great book from mediocrity to dynamic living. And it goes along with what you two are saying. Um, we'll, I'll just read a little bit. In the introduction, he says, uh, he introduces, of course, um, the perfect resource as being revealed in Christ. And he says, 
the Christian is not made to only survive or just get through life. When there's no growth or transformation, then we are left to mediocrity. The inner life produces a radical life, which is misunderstood. And listen to this. The true meaning of radical means speaks of someone being close to the source. What definition and contrast this brings as we are constantly being transformed into another's image? The source that I choose to live from makes a difference. I can, here's the key, I can experience a limited source where things are counted and calculated, or I can enjoy an inexhaustible source that brings personal revival from the inside out. Radical grace produces radical change. Wow. Beautiful. Yeah, that says it all. It, doesn't it, though? That, mm. that is, that's quickening at its best. It is, and it, we've got to learn to take those steps of faith that allow us to rise above the level of mediocrity because it's so easy to settle for that, isn't it? Yes. Mm. It's comfortable. Yeah. It's safe. Mm-hmm. It's natural. So yes. May God quicken yeah. us to be spiritually minded. Amen. And radical. And radical, as you are, <laughs> and as your brother is beside me. <laughs> yeah, because of radical grace. Amen. Oh, I love you both. Thanks so Bye. much, Jenny. Great to hear from you. Final thoughts, Pastor Sturridge, as we wrap up this Tuesday edition of the Grace Hour. I, I just, I, probably 1 Corinthians seven twenty nine that when Paul finished speaking about all those things, he said, I do not say these things to put a, a halter upon you, but that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. Mm. That's it, isn't it? Yeah. That we might attend upon the Lord without distraction. Praise God. And Tess, we love your thought that you just shared with us from Malmo, Sweden. She says, it's the word that quickens me because Christ himself is that word. Amen. Well, Thanks so much for joining us. Pastor Sturge, great to have you with us today. Thanks for having me. Uh, It's our pleasure. We hope to have you back again soon. And thank you for joining us, friends, for this, the Tuesday edition of the Grace Hour. We're going to be back tomorrow. As we mentioned a little bit earlier in the program, we're going to continue this message. Uh, The first half of it we shared with you today. We'll finish it up tomorrow on the Wednesday edition of the Grace Hour. So thanks again for being a part of our program. And we look forward to joining you again tomorrow at the same time. Thanks for listening to The Grace Hour. Our live program airs weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Grace Hour is a ministry of the Greater Grace Church. You are invited to visit Greater Grace at 6025 Moravia Park Drive, Baltimore, Maryland, 21206. For more information, go to gracehour.org or call 1-800-338-7060.